So I'm going to talk about blood sugar now, and uh, I actually was a doctor once upon a time, and then I went in front of the camera as a presenter, and I involved myself in doing lots of self-experiments. This one infested, did anyone see that? I'm in Kenya, and I'm about to swallow some tapeworms here. And uh, eight weeks later, I swallowed a pill camera, and this is what I saw, actually in a Chinese restaurant. There it is. I had triplets. Now, uh, I'm actually best known, obviously, for the 5-2 diet, which is about intermittent fasting. And it's really very simple. You cut your calories to a quarter, uh, 600 calories roughly. You do it twice a week. Uh, I chose Mondays and Thursdays, at least in part, because the Prophet Muhammad also did, and I thought I would get the Muslim vote on it. <laughs> now, does it work? That was me before. That's me now. <laughs> There's no doubt. Now, I'm actually not going to talk about the 5-2 diet, though I may allude to it again in a moment. Um, I'm actually going to talk about uh, blood sugar, which is described as the greatest health threat of our times, and it is indeed. Now, I wonder how many people have actually had their blood sugars tested in the last six months? Okay? And how were you? Were you okay? So, does anyone know if a figure of 5.7 millimoles per litre, is that good or bad? Fasting blood glucose. Anyone know? Sorry? It's pretty bad. It's kind of higher end of normal if you're a Brit, and it's pre-diabetic if you're an American. So there's different figures. And uh, the problem is, obviously, it leads to diabetes. And the biggest problem with sugar in your blood is we need it to fuel it. We need it for our brains. Uh, but when it's in your blood, what it does is it binds to the walls of the arteries. It also binds to the collagen in your face. And if you have high blood sugar, it will make you look older but it will also bugger up your arteries, and that has terrible consequences. So it doubles your risk of dementia. Uh, it causes, it's the leading cause of blindness in the UK, leading cause of kidney failure, leading cause of amputation and of impotence. So it adds up to quite a number of things. And to put a human face on it, this is George. And uh, I took this picture of George a few weeks ago. He's a diabetic, 62, and this is George's foot. George has had most of his toes amputated, and he's about to lose his leg because of diabetes. And this is what he was offered for breakfast by the NHS. That and that. They might have just stuffed his face in a bowl of sugar and got it over with. And I think that is both shocking and awful, and yet it is completely typical. I was sitting in my GP surgery the other day. They were showing a video of the sort of things you should eat, and blimey, it was that, and it was that. And what's astonishing, when I went to medical school, we learned nothing about nutrition. I learned an awful lot about all the bones in the human body, but nothing at all about exercise or nutrition. And my son is currently at medical school, and he is being taught absolutely nothing. Don't you see how shocking? It's extraordinary. We know the impact of food on health, and yet doctors don't, which is why they don't uh, give advice. A few facts for you. 7,000 amputations because of type 2 diabetes, uh, cuts your life expectancy by 10 years, 4 million adults, doubled in the last 15 years, and actually cost 24 billion. 10 billion for the direct costs, 14 billion for the indirect costs, which include amputation costs you 60,000 a pop, plus you have to look after them for the rest of their lives. That's 24 billion pounds. That's 20% of the NHS budget. It's due to double in the next 20 years. And um, we're actually not doing so badly. Sorry, sorry. This is basically it's the tip of the iceberg because we know that uh, over a third of adults now have prediabetes, which means they are on the road. That rate has tripled in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, it was 11%. It's now 36%. We're going in the wrong direction. Uh, worldwide, it is worse. There are 420 million. In China, 100 million diabetics and 500. It's half a billion people who they now reckon have prediabetes. And if you are a drug company, this is absolutely fantastic. This is the biggest wall, you know, windfall in the history of pharmacy. Because the fantastic thing about diabetics is they don't die immediately. They linger on really sick, and they have to be treated with your drugs. So that is a massive windfall. I should obviously get into that market. Uh, this is a 48-year-old woman, uh, diabetic type 2 from Vietnam. 
Uh, I spoke to a surgeon. He said they're cutting off more legs because of diabetes than during the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, rates have increased tenfold since uh, 1981. Tenfold in Vietnam alone. Uh, and it is the same all over the East and other parts of the world. Now, I'm interested because four years ago, I discovered I was a type 2 diabetic. My dad had it. I shouldn't have been surprised. But when my GP told me I had type 2 diabetes, I was surprised. And she said very kindly, I think we should start you on drugs. And very kindly, I said, no thanks. I mean, one of the things you may not know is that certainly in Buckinghamshire, my wife is around here somewhere, she's a GP in Buckinghamshire. In Buckinghamshire, and I don't know how many other health authorities, as a GP, you do not get paid to help people lose weight. You get paid to put people on metformin. So if you actually decide you don't want to put them on drugs and you want them to lose weight, you will lose money. So I discovered I was type 2 diabetic, and I decided to go and find out something which would not involve a lifetime on drugs, and I came across intermittent fasting. I made a documentary for Horizon with myself as the subject. And this guy changed my life. He's Dr. Mark Matson, professor of neuroscience at the US Institute on Aging, and probably the most cited and respected neuroscientist in the world. And his obsession is dementia. And what he showed is that intermittent fasting, certainly in animals, significantly cuts your risk of getting demented. So um, on his advice, I created the 5-2 diet, which I've described before, and uh, the film went out. Now, these are my stats. Beforehand, I was 85 kilos. I was 28% body fat. My waist was 36 inches. And my blood glucose was well in the diabetic range. Basically, anything over 7 is diabetic. And IGF-1, which is a measure of cancer risk, was right at the top of the scale. And I didn't look particularly fat there. Do I? Not particularly fat. So I was what's known as a toffee, thin on the outside, fat inside. I will show you what the inside looks like in a moment. And this was after. So basically, I shed uh, around 9 kilos in 12 weeks by doing intermittent fasting. Body fat went down 21%. What was best of all is my blood glucose went straight back into the normal range, and it has stayed there for the last four years. Plus, my cancer risk halved. Uh, it went down right to the bottom of the scale rather than the top. So naturally, I wrote a diet book. And a lot of people sent me selfies afterwards, showing how well uh, they'd done on it. Here's Alex from Scotland. <laughs> and George from London. And I'm, I'm very pleased with George, because every time he gets interviewed, he talks about the 5-2 diet, and I sell a few more books. Uh, but I wasn't that interested in diabetes when I was making that film, paradoxically, although I was myself a diabetic. But I spent the last three years uh, looking into it, and I must admit, I'm sort of shocked and surprised. OK, blame. It's always good to blame. So who is to blame? Well, sugar is a fairly obvious candidate, isn't it? Uh, anyone know what happened in 1850? Why did the Brits suddenly start consuming sugar like it was going out of fashion in 1850? Because Gladstone took the tax off sugar. That's what happened in 1850. And you see a couple of other blips, which are the First and Second World War. And now we are consuming it, almost our own body weight and sugar every year. And uh, not surprisingly, rates of diabetes also went up exactly in parallel with sugar consumption. And uh, in my lifetime, rates of diabetes in the UK have gone up from 1% to 8% of the population. So they have increased nearly tenfold, and I'm not that old. So, yes, children are consuming their own body weight and sugar, and probably more. And we know who the villains are, don't we? Good old Coca-Cola. They, um, they account for about 40% of sugar consumption by kids. Well, not Coca-Cola, fizzy drinks, sorry, I should have said. And uh, cornflakes and Dr. John Kellogg. You familiar with Dr. John Kellogg? This is a story I enjoy. Dr. John Kellogg invented cornflakes because he wanted to stop this disease. Basically, it causes cancer of the womb, urinary diseases, nocturnal emissions, impotence, epilepsy. It can lead to death. The victim literally dies by his own hand. What's he talking about? Masturbation, exactly. That's why Kellogg cornflakes were invented, because he wanted to stop boys masturbating. <laughs> True fact. And he actually suggested circumcision for boys and for girls if they were ever caught masturbating. And at the time, basically, the great American public, if you were rich, you ate eggs and you ate bacon. And if you were poor, you ate porridge. So Kellogg decided to change that. And he was very successful. And we now know what happened. And it is a m magic thing about marketing that we have somehow become you know, we have decided it's a good idea to feed our kids on a food which is 40% sugar. Uh, another villain, I'm afraid, uh, this is Ansel Keys. Have you heard of him? 
He's the guy who basically changed our entire diet. So he was a physiologist back in the 1950s. He converted the Americans to the idea of the low-fat diet. Uh, he, and that changed the world. Because what happened when people went low-fat, they basically stopped eating butter, they stopped drinking cream, and instead they ate uh, horrible low carb stuff instead. He also basically demonized eggs because of cholesterol, whereas we now know eggs are incredibly healthy, and there was never, ever any risk that if you ate eggs, it would be bad for you. So um, there's a villain. Ah, but every story needs a hero. And my story has a hero, and it's this guy, who is Professor Roy Taylor, who is Professor of Medicine and Metabolism at Newcastle University. And he's my hero because he worked out what causes type 2 diabetes and how to reverse it. And it is regarded as an incurable disease, but he has shown it is curable. And uh, he realized, obviously, like everyone else, it's to do with abdominal fat. But it's actually where the fat gets deposited. So he stuck them in his body scanners, and this, this is what he saw. That white stuff is all fat. That is actually me. That is a scan they did on me before I lost the weight. And all that white stuff there is fat, which is encasing your internal organs. And that is what leads to type 2 diabetes and problems with blood sugar control. Because what it does is it saturates your liver and your pancreas. And when those two stop talking to each other, your blood sugars go a bit crazy. And uh, what Taylor also showed was that if he put his patients on an 800-calorie diet for eight weeks, then he could reverse it in the vast majority of cases. And the vast majority of patients who went to take part in the trials were told by their doctor it would never work. They would never stick to it. It would never work. This was absolute fantasy. They were wasting their time. But Taylor persisted, and he showed the average weight loss in eight weeks of 15 kilos. And if you had been diabetic for less than four years, then basically it was 87% reversal, and longer than eight years, then it was 50%, which is remarkable. And this is an example, Elizabeth who had been diabetic for six years when she heard about the, the low-calorie diet. And uh, she went from size 22 down to 12, and she's now off all medication. She basically reversed her diabetes. And what is interesting about Taylor's work is it flies in the face of almost everything we have been told over the last 20 years, because his is effectively a crash diet. It's a fast, rapid weight loss diet. Uh, which we're told is a really bad idea, we should lose weight slowly. Actually, there's never been any evidence for that. Every long-term trial has suggested that actually the amount of weight you lose in the first three weeks is the best predictor of the weight you will lose at a year, two years, five years, and ten years. There is so much misinformation out there. Right, I'm being gestured at. Uh, the other thing that happened uh, is in these patients is they just drain the fat out of their liver. So you have 30% 6% liver fat over there, that's the green stuff, and that's afterwards. Black space basically shows there's no longer fat there. Fat in the liver is now uh, the major cause of liver transplants in the UK. It's overtaken alcohol as a major cause of liver failure. So um, he and a colleague at Glasgow University are now doing a big trial in the north of England, uh, looking at comparing uh, the effects of this low-calorie diet with standard medical treatment. And the results will be out in a couple of years' time. So I read a book about, so I read a book about this, naturally enough, uh, which is out there. And uh, I, it's, it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And I do think uh, it really matters. Uh, now, with Taylor's work, what he did is he basically put people on uh, food sachets because it was convenient. I think you can do it with real food. And I think the evidence is very strong that the real food we should be eating is essentially a Mediterranean-style diet. So when you look at these things, there is olive oil there, there is nuts there. The uh, low-fat diet has been tested, tested, tested to death. It does not bloody work. People do not stick to it. They do not produce the benefits that you imagine. The American government has spent nearly a billion dollars testing the low-fat diet, and it has failed every time. Mediterranean diet is not pasta and pizza. <laughs> I'm sorry, it is not. It is basically, it is olive oil, it is fish, it is things like that. It is also red wine, because contrary to what you might be led to expect by a recent government announcement, there is actually very good evidence that moderate quantities of red wine are good for you. And that's indeed what uh, the only proper randomized controlled trial, they actually got a group of people, and they asked them to drink either red wine, white wine, or water. These were non-drinkers. 
and they followed them for two years. They had to drink one glass of wine or one glass of water. They were randomly allocated, and what they found at the end of that time was the people who got the most benefit were the red wine drinkers, followed by the white wine drinkers, followed by the water drinkers. <laughs> so I combine it basically because exercise is a hugely important element. This is me doing something called HIT. I did a program called Truth About Exercise. Have you ever seen that? It was Horizon basically looking at how you can get most of the benefits of exercise from about three minutes a week. Basically, three minutes of intense pushing yourself is an awful lot better than half an hour of sort of gentle meandering. And the other thing you need to do is you need to do muscle building because that is absolutely critical because after the age of 40-odd, you start to lose about 1% of your muscle every year. So, and the other thing I'm a big fan of is mindfulness, meditation. Because what we know about obesity, what we know about uh, hunger, what we know about blood sugar, is a lot of it is down to stress. People eat because... Uh, they comfort eat because they are stressed. Because they're, you know, as Edgar was saying, it's all about emotion. A lot of it is about how you feel about your current situation. If you get depressed, you reach for the donut. And how do you learn to cope with that? I think mindfulness is probably one of the most effective ways you can do that. So uh, there are kind of apps you can get. You can join a course. Uh, it, it's just remarkable. I've been doing it regularly now. So. I had uh, lots of emails since uh, the book went out, and I'm pleased to say somebody wrote to me the, uh, yesterday saying that um, in a week they'd lost seven pounds and their blood glucose levels had come down from over eight to 4.7. So I'm very proud of this book because I think it could change things. I could be wrong. I could be optimistic. But I do think that uh, there is a terrible amount of misinformation out there. I think that we are facing something of a catastrophe, and I think, like the others, or most of the others. I think, I think we need to lead something of a revolution on this. So um, I absolutely endorse everything you said, which is basically sit at a table, eat that. But beyond that, I would also go, and I do believe actually food and science do run hand in hand. Uh, essentially, it's Mediterranean style, always take the stairs, aim to do 10,000 steps, do your strength exercise, bit of hit, skip meals, skipping meals is good, uh, and meditate. And of course, occasionally, give in to temptation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>